Cashflow Diary Podcast, Episode 3. Congratulations, you showed up. Give yourself a high five in celebration of your success. Welcome to the Cashflow Diary, where new and experienced investors come to take confident action towards their goals. Your host is a family man, a real estate entrepreneur, investor, coach, and instructor. As a master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cashflow 101 game, he's inspired many to begin their journey into creating cash flow for themselves and their family. And now, here he is to offer you the tools required to earn the income desired. Your cash flow coach, Jay Massey. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary. My name is Jay. I will be your cash flow coach for the next few minutes. And most importantly, if you haven't done so already, uh, make sure that you go over to the website Cashflow diary.com get access to your free course cash flow foundation that'll teach you the beginning steps necessary to create cash flow whether it is you're building a business building real estate no matter what business you're in uh, you'll be able to use this information to get the foundation necessary to create cash flow so that you'll never need a job again if you are listening to us for the first time uh, make sure that you listen to the first episode so that you can understand the format Uh, of the show and how we're running and if you've already been to the website you may have noticed that it all the details are not there yet just go ahead and put your name and info uh, on the website and you will be one of the first notified when cashflow foundation and everything else uh, that's coming your way from the cashflow diary is absolutely ready so let's start today's show with a quote uh, i like i like to do this particular quote says the following it says interdependent people combine their own efforts with the efforts of others to achieve their greatest success. The gentleman who said that, Stephen Richards Covey. Some of you know, or you may not know, that he recently passed away. Uh, He's an American educator, author, businessman, motivational speaker. You may have heard of his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If not, uh, there are some of his other books were the First Things First, Principle-Centered Leadership, The Seven seven Habits of Highly Effective Families, The Eighth Habit, The Leader in Me, How Schools and Parents Around the World Are Inspiring Greatness, and One Child at a Time. He is a man that has influenced many, many lives. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People has been on bestseller lists for decades, Not, not just weeks. It's measured in decades. It's crazy how long uh, his books have been there. And he's actually, if you've ever heard the phrase, begin with the end in mind, he's the one where that comes from. And it's one of the phrases that I love to use and think about when you go out there with businesses, beginning with the end in mind. And all of us as real estate investors uh, need to make sure that we're doing that. As business owners, real estate investors, as fathers, husbands, you know, spouses, whatever. We have to begin with the end in mind so that we stay on track, on focus uh, to what it is that we're hoping to achieve. But the theme of this show is about teamwork. And that's why I like this particular quote, because it says interdependent, not intradependent (laughs) people combine their own efforts with the efforts of others to achieve their greatest success. What it's simply saying is that you know, it, it, it takes all of us to achieve your greatest success. There is no such thing, in my opinion, as a self-made millionaire. There's no, or millionaires. There, there's no such thing. Those things don't exist. And in our pursuit of cash flow, what we must do is we must all continue to be, learn to be better team players and more interdependent. So, Today's two cents. My two cents on today is simply answering one of your questions. Uh, and a common question that I think is out there is, you know, what is cash flow? And if you're wondering how can you get your question answered, all you have to do is send in an email to cashflowquestion at cashflowdiary.com. And what we will be able to do is we'll sort through all of the entries and pick the ones that we think make the best. And we'll do our best to get your question answered so that you have an opportunity uh, to get it uh, answered. So today's question: What is cash flow? Uh, we you're tuned into the cash flow diary, 
<laughs> we talk about the cash flow diary podcast we we've got products relating and and not products but uh, courses that are called cash flow foundation what what is cash flow you know people talk about it a lot and it's just a simple definition in my opinion and many of you already know it you just i'm just going to say it in a completely different way think of it as income minus expenses equals net operating income minus any sort of debt service equals cash flow that's what it is so basically you're going to take all your income from whatever you know enterprise or entity that you've got going on you're going to take all your expenses and then any loans or debt service that you might have to pay and what's left called cash flow here's what's interesting sometimes when you're out there in the marketplace people call cash flow different things sometimes you ask someone you know what's the cash flow in this property and they'll say eight hundred dollars well eight hundred dollars could actually be what is typically called the gross income meaning the rent on that particular property and sometimes when you say what's the cash flow people will give you the cash flow but they won't include things like debt service and that that could be okay uh but sometimes they'll say you know hey the the income is or the cash flow is 800 the expenses are 200 and that makes the cash flow 600 dollars. well my question always is is what's included in your definition of those expenses Here's some ideas if you're wondering, if you're wondering, you know, if all of the expenses are included, because when you're on the buying side, you're you're trying to think about any and everything that could possibly happen. And here's just an example. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. And it's very focused on, say, single family houses as opposed to, say, apartment buildings or industrial complexes. But here are some of the expenses that you should be thinking about when it comes to your particular piece of real estate or your business in general. One of those expenses is management. Someone has to watch over and, you know, watch over the hens in the chicken coop, so to speak. So there's usually a management fee or some sort of management arrangement that costs something. Maybe it's a salary. Sometimes it's a fee. Uh, advertising. That could sometimes be included with your management, uh, but maybe not always. Uh, then you must always remember bank charges because you're likely to have an account uh, that is related to that particular property. And then you've got borrowing costs, which is usually interest. Sometimes it could be points and interest or just points. It depends. And you also, you know, you've got cleaning and then you may have a tenant placement fee or some sort of commission to find your customer if you're using a third party or things of that nature. Uh, you also want to think about legal costs and things like eviction and court appearances and occasionally uh, you, you just never know what it might come up. Uh, depreciation, not necessarily an expense per se, but it is something you want to keep track of. So in, in terms of the cash flow, but you want to know it because I know many of you know, if you're listening to the previous episodes, the phantom expense of depreciation, it doesn't actually apply here. Uh, however, you still have, you know, utilities, electricity, gas, water, sewer, uh, gardening, lawn, some of those things are definitely still there. Inspection costs, you never know. Like for example, on one of my units, what we have to do is we have to do the city ordinance requires an annual inspection, an annual inspection, no matter what. And so that there's an inspection cost that is definitely included. Insurance. And now insurance can be a tricky topic and it's probably something we should, you know, just talk about one day uh, on one particular episode in and of itself, because you could have your, you know, your standard hazard insurance. And then you could also have your builder's risk insurance and you could got your umbrella insurance, you've got all kinds of insurance and things of that nature going on. Uh, then you may have some property taxes, likely. Um, and let's not forget uh, things like pest control, <laughs> because occasionally you do have pests. And I don't mean your tenants. Uh, I mean pests. You know, I know for a fact one time, one of the units uh, that I, I have, it somehow managed to get fleas. And that was a very, that was a very interesting situation. That's all I'm going to say on that. And then you got to have repairs and maintenance and sometimes stationary postage, telephones, especially if you have an office on site, uh, that could be very, very important for you to understand. Uh, and don't forget about travel because at some point, or maybe some of you, your properties that you're after aren't necessarily next door to you, but you need to go see them. So that becomes part of the overall expense. Uh, and then if anything or whatever is left over after that, hey, that's your cash flow. There you go. 
Uh, that's a quick understanding of the income minus some of the expenses, and you probably thought of three or four more. And, and then you got to subtract out your, you know, debt service. Or when I say debt service, it's just simply another name for your what most people call your mortgage payment. And you want to take that out, and then what's left over is simply called cash flow. Today's episode, we're focusing on the theme of teamwork makes the dream work. And what it comes down to is that for most of us, you know, when we first start in real estate, we don't have the team uh, necessary to be able to get things done. And we want to know who those most important people are to help you create success. You want to know who those people you need to be looking for, who is it that you need to be finding, and and who is out there. I I find it interesting. uh, In fact, what particularly inspired this particular episode was the fact that the uh, men's the USA men's Olympic team failed to medal uh, as a team. So they, they couldn't even, you know, get into the uh, get on the podium, even though they were expected and favored to win. And one of the things that you you got to understand is, you know, who's on your team. And in, in this particular instance, uh, you want to know that you want to know who is on your team. Like, for example, what are some of the roles? What are those roles of people who need to be on your team? Well, if you looked at or listened to some of the expenses that we just talked about, it probably will give a hint as to who some of the people are that need to be on your team. For example, if you end up with a mortgage on a property, you typically have you have a loan officer or someone else. Uh, If not just a loan officer, you probably you might even if you arrange some private financing, there might be not only a lender, but a servicing agent uh, who has the ability to actually service the loan so that, you know, you send your payments in, etc. You might have the property manager, as you've heard, uh, who has to keep, as I said, you know, watch over the hens in the hen house. Uh, So you've got your property manager. You may actually have a person who is just all they do is your insurance. And that that's the main thing that they focus on is just insurance and how to make sure that your portfolio is properly protected uh, from any peril that's out there. Uh, You may have a housing inspector, you know, termite inspector, (laughs) flea inspector. No, just a general pest guy in general uh, is definitely something that you're going to want to have. And not to mention uh, you a good realtor can make you a ton of money or lose you a ton of money, depending on how you find and source that particular individual as well. Uh, cleaning crews. These are all individuals that are definitely necessary on the team to help property and and things run well. Well, those aren't the only people though. Some of the other people that you you might want to think about are what I call the internal team. People like your attorney or maybe your CFO or someone. And when I say CFO, I don't, don't think bookkeeper. I mean someone who can help you think not just tactically and and put stuff in QuickBooks or, or QuickBooks Enterprise or Quicken or what have you, or whatever you know program you want to use, but someone who can also help you think on a financial higher level that is also strategic in the financing of the company and helping you achieve you know your cash flow and income goals. So yeah, definitely the CFO or the chief operations officer. You need one of those because at some point uh, you may not want to operate all of the data that comes in. Like if your portfolio grows or as your portfolio grows, you get to a point to where you have a lot of data that comes in between the first and the fifth or the first and the fifteenth every month, and that has a lot of that begins to affect the quality of service that you deliver to your customers. And you want to make sure that the, you know, COO is there to help you with the operations and being able to find things like, you know, put systems in place uh, to make that simple. Now, these aren't things that you all start out with. Clearly, you understand that, you know, these team members, you don't need them all to do your first deal. But it's definitely something that you want to have in the back of your head so that you know that at some point I'm going to need these things so that when you do meet people who you think are of quality, that you can begin to put it in the back of your mind and make sure that you know at some day sometime you may actually need their services so that leads us to the next part which comes first you know the team or the deal well it for some people it's a matter of you know for most people it's a matter of preference for me uh my preference is to eventually get to the point to where when I'm ready to do a deal, I know exactly who to call. I may not have sat down and interviewed and gone through all of the specifics of every team member, but as I'm doing my due diligence on any particular piece of property, I want to be in a position to where I'm not sitting down with someone saying, hey, for example, 
this is how I, I've seen a lot of people do it. Say they're going to a new marketplace and then they go and they want to meet with a realtor and they'll set up appointments with five or six realtors saying something like this. Hi, you know, my name is Jay and what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to do some real estate uh, in your area and I'd like to sit down to talk to you so that, you know, I can find out some information. Well, that's good and there's nothing wrong with that. However, my preference is to approach those realtors this way, to say, hi, or whatever team member, it doesn't matter what team member, but hi, my name is Jay. I have a property on 123 Main Street that's currently under you know contract for me to purchase. I'd like to sit down and talk with you to see if you are open to uh, being able to manage it and manage it in the way that works with my organization. And that I have found to be a better way to go through the process of building the team that they take you more seriously. Uh, I take me more seriously. Everything, the questions that you ask are different. Everything changes. Uh, so for me, I, I like the deal to be under contract as I go out there and, and build the team. But again, everybody has their own personal you know, preference, uh, however they want to do it. There's no really right or wrong. At the whole point of this show uh, today is to make sure that you understand that it, it takes a team of people and lots of interviewing and lots of time uh, to put it together so that you can build your success. Now, today uh, we have a, another <laughs> cash flow question. The last week's question, if you remember, uh, was name the two, name two of the seven U.S. states that currently do not have a state income tax. You're supposed to name two of the seven U.S. states that currently do not have a state income tax. Well, depending on how you looked at this particular question, you could have actually come up with any of nine answers. Any of nine answers. Here are the answers and I'll explain. Uh, the states are, in no particular order, Alaska, Florida, Nevada, South Dakota, Texas, Washington, Wyoming, Tennessee, and New Hampshire. Now, the first seven that I named have no income tax, state income tax whatsoever. Tennessee and New Hampshire, however, have what you could call a limited income tax because they tax dividends and interest income only. So you could have kind of come up with a total of any of those nine states and you would have been sort of right and it's all good. All right. So what is this week's question? What was the name of the location where the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank is thought to have been formed? What is the name of the location where the Federal Reserve Bank is thought to have been formed? There's a popular book out there uh, with the name in the title, and I probably just gave it away for some of you, but let's see who can get it right. Anyway. Let's get back to our main topic. When it comes to your teams, and if you remember, uh, when you're talking about the you know Olympic team or any team, you, you're, the entire team is only as strong as the weakest link. You've heard that before, but we now have an example. You have a visual example if you were watching the Olympics of the weakest link. And here's what I like to do, and what I'm going to suggest. What I'm going to suggest for you, I'm going to suggest that you want to become the weakest link on your team. You want to be the weakest link. I love it when my team gets together and they just start talking and solving problems. And I'm just like, I have no idea what they're talking about. They've got the complete solution. They understand completely what needs to be done. They're serving the customer. Everything's getting handled. And all I have to do is go, yeah, that sounds good. That is a great position. Because otherwise, you have to be the one with all of the answers, all of the time, all of the resources, all of the knowledge, and that can become a lot of pressure. But if you can call your insurance person and you know that they are competent and confident in what it is that they're saying, you have the ability to rely upon their information to be able to achieve success. Same thing with your financial person. Same thing with your property managers. Because could you imagine if you didn't have a reliable teammate and then you relied on their answers, what would happen? Or if you had to go out there and become someone who was proficient at all of the pieces that it takes to do business. You want to become the weakest link, period. And here is probably, this next piece is probably and by far the most important piece when it comes to putting your team together. Understand this. 
most teams, most sports teams specifically. Let's talk about baseball. I'm not a baseball guy, but let's talk. Uh, when do they have one pitcher or two? Do they have one first baseman or one player that could play first base or more than one? Do they have one catcher? Do they even have one coach? Do they have one of any position whatsoever? I mean, there's probably even a backup water boy. You get my point. You want to make sure that your business never has a single point of failure. You've got to have your first string, second string, third string, maybe not fourth string, but you want to have enough relationships to be able to replace any person at any time so that when, not if, but when something happens, you are in a position of strength to be able to insert that person into the lineup and you don't have to play the game a man down. You want to always have a backup. A single point of failure is a very, very expensive mistake. So what does that mean? That means you may have a property manager, but who's the backup property manager when or if that particular property manager no longer performs the way you want, can't get you the reports, doesn't send the money, can't do direct deposit, uh, or whatever it, it comes down to. Who's, who do you plan on, whose shoulder can you tap and say, hey, uh, can you fill in for me on this person? Can you fill in for me on this play? Uh, who, who is your backup insurance person? Who's your backup any person? Any person you think needs to be on the team, any person that you have on your team, uh, who's the backup? Because you want to make sure that you can insert someone there at any time. Because if someone falls or gets hurt, you have to go in to fill in the spaces. And that, that could be fine for you. But for some of you, that may not be fine. And what you want to make sure that happens is that you have the ability to keep functioning in your business even though all of that is going on. Okay, now we've done all this talk about the team and who should be on it and why and what for and weakest links and single points of failure. I want to give you some ideas of questions that you should be asking because sometimes that we don't know what we don't know about our team or teammates and we don't know what we should be asking them or what we could ask them. So what I've done is I've actually taken a property management focus. And I've got a list here from one of the requests for proposals that I send out personally to property managers. And I'm just gonna suggest some of the questions that you could ask uh, a property manager, but that doesn't mean these questions are restricted only to a property manager, but some of the questions that you could ask, just some. For example, you may do all your numbers and those numbers are based upon usually when you're looking at holding property long term, they're based upon local market occupancy or vacancy rates. And you may ask yourself or want to ask them, hey, since you're going to be the one in control of a lot of the things here, how would you propose we get this particular property, this single family house to make sure that of the single family houses that are owned in this entire portfolio, how how do we maintain an 85, 95, 105, whatever the percentage occupancy rate that you want to maintain for your entire portfolio? Ask them, what is your strategy? What strategy would you employ to maintain this level of occupancy? Because you know that your portfolio needs a certain level of occupancy to make it all work. Then you want to follow stuff like that up with, well, how long would it take for you to achieve that? Or what would you need from me to make sure that you could do that? What when you've done that in the past, what was necessary or what pitfalls or what helped you to fall short that you don't want to have happen again to make sure that we could be successful? Here's another question that I enjoy asking property managers or any vendor for that matter, especially this one. What type of work do you prefer to do and which ones do you do best? Some property managers are really, really good at, say, higher-end properties. But they could prefer to do lower-end properties. And they could have their preferences for their own reasons. But if you don't know that, you, you may find out that you ended up hiring someone who is really better at the higher-end stuff and would rather be doing the lower-end stuff. 
Now, that's usually not the case. It's usually the other way around, that they're really good at the lower end stuff and they'd rather be doing the higher end stuff. But I think you get my point. Same thing happens with, say, your rehab contract or your maintenance person or any of them. You know, what types of rehabs do you prefer to do? What type of work and what type of materials do you prefer to work with? Because that could give you an indication of what he or she is best at and what they're going to be best at at working for you. Okay? Here's another one. If you had to choose an area of town to work in, which area would you choose to work in and why? That's also going to give you a lot of information about the marketplace. It's just another way of getting some of the same information, but asking it in a different way because they're the local individuals who know the marketplaces and you want to make sure that they know the town and more importantly, they know what parts of town that you want to stay uh, away from. Here's some more questions. Simply describe your company's process for collecting rents. Simple rent collection because while it sounds simple to you in your head, it may not be that simple, especially when it comes down to proper accounting procedures, when it comes to making sure your accounts receivables and payables and all these other things are done properly, especially once you start getting fancy, right? Say you start adding a cell phone tower or a laundry room or a laundry room, even worse, a laundry room that's not coin operated. How do you track that income and make sure that you still receive it? And here's one of my favorite questions. What is your company's process for retaining long-term tenants, tenants that last more than 12 months? What you want to know is, is this property management company known for complete tenant turnover? Like, do the average tenant stay on their books five or six months and then jet? If so, there's probably a reason for that. And you want to know that up front because that's going to affect your profitability. That's going to affect your bottom line and it's your bottom line that you ultimately care about and you want to employ people who can help you achieve the objectives that you are after all of these questions that i'm giving you are in addition to everything else you already know things like screening quality tenants things like eviction procedures collection procedures uh, advertising procedures what all of those things go into but i was trying to uh, illustrate some additional questions that that I've just learned from experience that I now must ask. Here's another one. You might even want to ask, what is your company's policy on maintenance? And are you related to any of the vendors you are recommending? Sometimes this happens, you may not know it. The property manager is related to, you know, the maintenance person who happens to be a cousin. And you never know that, you know, if cousin happens to need some extra money and suddenly guess what? You know what you needed yet that, that wall painted that's what happens i'm not saying that that's going to happen i'm just saying be aware and ask because the more questions you can ask the better prepared you can be for any sort of, of emergency that might possibly happen here's another section of questioning that i like to ask i want to know if or what political connections or city connections inspector connections what else comes along with this relationship? Who do you know that I get to leverage and benefit from because I know you and you and I choose to do business? I want to know because there are times where you may need to call upon those additional individuals and you may even want to meet them ahead of time just so that you can go out there and present your company in such a way that they understand who you are, what you're doing, and that you're there to help. And you never know what resource may lie around the corner. See, the vendors that you hire, they're not just there to do a service. They're there to help you expand your network as well. Because the more people you know that have more skill sets, the more problems you as the real estate entrepreneur can solve. But it all starts with you building a competent team. Benjamin Franklin said it best. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You will have to do the work to have a solid team. And here's the interesting thought process that I want to leave you with today. Either you will do the work up front or you'll do it on the back end as you clean up the mess.
Thank you for investing your time with Jay Massey and the Cash Flow Diary. When you have a moment, please visit iTunes and leave a positive comment about the show. And go now to our website, CashflowDiary.com, to take advantage of our free business building course, Cash Flow Foundation. Gain the knowledge, understanding, and skill that will teach you how to never need a job again. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.